Hello, welcome to today's webinar. Um, this is the ASQ Statistics Division webinar. Um, I'm Jenny Hellrun. Um, today we'll have a, a great presentation. Um, everybody will be muted though, so if you have questions, please type them in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, in a couple of days, you'll receive an email from me which will be your record um, for credit for watching the webinar. Um, I will also show you where the presentation slides will be available from our division webpage um, under resources that will be in the email. Also a link to our YouTube channel where the webinar will be recorded and posted. So look for that in a couple of days. Um, we have a great speaker today, Heidi Gilroy. Um, she is the Director of Professional Development, Magnet, and Research at Memorial Hermann, the Woodlands Medical Center. Dr. Gilroy earned her PhD in Nursing Science at Texas Women's University and her Master's in Nursing with a Public Health, health Focus at Benedicti Benedictine University. She has served in clinical and leadership positions in community, academic, and hospital settings. Dr. Gilroy's primary research interest is the effects of trauma on health and functioning in various populations. She has written dozens of articles and presented research and theory work at national and international conferences. And we are lucky to have her give a talk today on using Delphi methodology to create a social ecological model. And I will pass that on to Heidi now. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here. Thank you, Jenny and Rowena, for inviting me to present. Um, so I'm going to talk today about using Delphi methodology. If you've never heard of this methodology before, I think you're in for a real treat. This is a very accessible um, kind of research method. It requires very small sample sizes, uh, kind of basic qualitative and quantitative data analysis skills. So a lot of folks can use this. And even though it is pretty simple at the face of it, uh, we can come up with some pretty informative and insightful um, kind of conclusions as a result of doing this type of work. Um, so if you, if you have never heard of it before, I hope that you'll come through to the end of this presentation, maybe with some ideas of how you can apply it. Um, maybe some you know, food for thought with some of your current projects or some things you're working on with your teams. Um, if you have heard of it before, I hope you get a little extra confidence, uh, maybe a little extra insight in the methodology um, and some ideas also on how to use it in the future. So I'm going to go through um, probably in the next 45 minutes or so. I think I'm trying to leave uh, the opportunity for questions. I'm going to go over kind of the background and the history of the methodology, um, the purpose of it, uh, some the basic steps of the process. I'm going to give you some examples of the use of the Delphi methodology in, in practice. And then I'm going to go through a research project that we just completed um, using Delphi methodology in, in, uh, in my organization, just so that you can kind of see step by step how one goes through um, and uses this. So let's start out um, by talking about the Oh, no, I'm not. It's not changing on my screen. I'm just going to stop sharing and then start again. I do apologize. All right, hopefully we're working now. All right, so let's start off with the purpose of Delphi studies. So essentially Delphi is a, an anonymous brainstorming session. Okay, put together a group of experts, this group of experts comes together and anonymously um, brainstorms together through a series of iterative questions. And the overarching goal is to reach consensus. Um, and so this consensus is the outcome of your of your Delphi methodology study. 
So I'll tell you how this works by going back into Greek history. Um, hopefully at some point in your uh, high school or college career, you learned about the Oracle at Delphi. Um, if it's been too long since you thought about uh, the Oracle at Delphi, I'll give you a little bit of uh, a background on that to, to help you understand how the Delphi methodology works. So the Oracle at Delphi was a woman that was selected from a group of women who had dedicated themselves to the god Apollo um, in the city of Delphi at the temple. And folks would come and ask the Oracle questions about the future, about what they should do. And she would answer them. She would give them um, an answer based on um, Apollo's responses to these questions. So unfortunately, I mean, we all would love to, uh, to be able to ask someone in the future and have them tell us directly. But the Oracle at Delphi would talk in, in uh, rhymes and, and, uh, and riddles and poems instead of just saying directly what the future was going to be. And so the Oracle was surrounded by, uh, by prophets and um, and priests that would listen to what the oracle would say, as well as the question that was asked, and they'd come together and they would talk about uh, what the what the riddle meant, and then they would give the the person who asked the question the answer, uh, what Apollo had to say. So modern historians feel like the reason that this worked so well. I mean, certainly if the, if the if the oracle wasn't giving good future advice, people wouldn't come over and over again. So the reason that this worked so well was not that Apollo was talking to the oracle at Delphi, but that the priests and the prophets were basically experts in the geopolitical setting of, of uh, the ancient world. So they had people come through the temple who were uh, important politicians, important educators, important um, business people, and so they really understood the lay of the land. They understood what was going on in the world around them. And so as they came together to decipher these, these riddles, they were using a lot of expertise that they had about the goings on of the world. So they were able to make some educated guesses about what would happen and give sage advice based on that. So that's the power of bringing experts together and creating consensus. A little bit of history behind Delphi study. So it was not a very old methodology. It was first uh, developed in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, the U.S. military asked the RAND Corporation to, to find out more information about resources that would be needed for the Cold War. So this was something, a kind of war, a kind of, um, you know, political situation that no one had really ever encountered um, you know, they had just fought World War II, which was kind of a very direct and um, uh, war that, that had been the type of which had been fought before. But this Cold War was different. So nobody was able to look back in history and make precise um, estimations of the kind of resources that would be needed. And so Norman Dalkey and Olaf Helmer um, decided they needed to pull together some experts to determine, you know, what what they needed in order to, uh, to participate in this, in this Cold War, what the U.S. military should do to prepare. And so, obviously, if you need, you know, experts from around the world and different fields, it wasn't easy to get them all in the same room. So, so these two guys in the RAND Corporation uh, figured out a way to mail out these questions and have them answer them uh, on paper. So they got back all the information on paper, kind of figured out what the data was that was on paper, and then sent back out more questions. So this happened until the group reached consensus on what the U.S. military would really need um, in order to fight this Cold War. So you can actually see this paper. It's been, it's been uh, declassified now. It's a very interesting read. If, you, you know, if you're ever, if you're ever bored one day, um, interested in Delphi method, you can actually read the paper. It has all of the questions that they sent out listed. Um, and, uh, and so that was the first uh, Delphi study. So again, not a very old methodology, but, uh, but folks got, a, got wind of it, decided they liked it, that it might work for some of the things that they, that they were working on. And so some scientists wanted to actually test the method to prove it was a valid way of gaining consensus. So they actually sent out questions to the general public, um, just items that should be sort of general knowledge that most people would know, but maybe not everybody. Um, kind of like, and I have this 
snippet over um, on the slide, kind of like the poll the audience uh, from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? So the, uh, you know, in this case, when Sherlock Holmes retired from detective work, what profession did he take up? The audience together has come to the consensus that C is the answer, and that is the true answer. So these researchers going through a process like this, kind of a poll the audience, um, type of, uh, of situation actually were able to show that the Delphi methodology could be used to get the correct answer to questions based on consensus. The first study um, that was dealt using Delphi published outside of the RAND Corporation um, looked at long range trends in science and technology. So again, this, this future focused direction of Delphi is pretty common. But starting in the 1970s, the, the Delphi methodology has started to be used in healthcare a lot. And it really is a frequent tool for consensus in healthcare. We use it for to figure out new roles, um, to figure out competencies, um, to figure out resources that might be needed. Um, you know, the US military used it for bombs and, and we use it for um, other types of resources necessary in, in the healthcare world. So it's a very um, a, a common tool used in healthcare and a, a very helpful one as well. The theoretical foundations here, so you know, we know that it works in a similar way as the, the Oracle at Delphi, but but why does it work? So it, in essence, you know, in, in science, we often think about uh, the difference between knowledge and speculation as being very distinct. Um, what we know, what we can prove, um, versus what we think, what our opinion is. And so some folks believe um, that uh, there's kind of a spectrum here, that in between knowledge and speculation is wisdom, insight, uh, and informed judgment. So this informed judgment is really where uh, where the Delphi methodology comes in. So, for example, if if you wanted me to guess, um, you know, if we would have people living on Mars in 2050, um, I have no informed judgment about that. So I, I would be completely speculating because uh, I have no knowledge. I have no knowledge about um, about Mars whatsoever. So, so anything that I said, anything that I predicted about that would be pure speculation. But you ask me about how the healthcare system will work in 2050. I have a lot of, uh, of knowledge to back me up on that and a lot of experience. And so my informed judgment about what healthcare will look like in 2050 um, is probably a lot more like knowledge than speculation. So, um, so that is where we get our, our answers um, from Delphi is we're using this, this middle area, um, the wisdom and the insight and the informed judgment of experts. So the key attributes of a Delphi study are, first of all, the anonymity of responses. So this is very important. Um, we don't want anybody to know what anyone else is saying. We don't want anyone to know who is agreeing and who is disagreeing. Um, so we do that through uh, through sending out surveys, either through you know paper surveys through the mail, as the, the Rand Corporation did for the U.S. military. Um, you can do it in in person um, with pieces of paper in a room. Most commonly, we use uh, we use some kind of survey software where people can fill out a survey on their own time. Um, without putting their name in and, and send it in. The other key attribute is uh, iteration. So essentially asking the same questions or similar questions over and over again. So this iteration allows a change of opinion over the course of a study. So when we're looking for, uh, for consensus, um, we, we want to make sure that folks can, um, can, you know, can be informed or can learn new things as part of the process. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in an, um, in an argument with someone, but it's kind of hard sometimes to, uh, to change your opinion over time when you're in a group, when you're in a, um, you know, a room with everyone else. Um, but asking over and over in this, in this anonymous way really helps um, make sure that people are able to change that opinion and come to a consensus. So another key attribute is that participants receive feedback. Um, of their own responses and, and the group's responses as well. So they have to be able to see what they wrote um, or what they answered 
on uh, on the questions, and then they need to be able to see kind of the, the the compilation of everyone else's answers as well. So they can start to look at where they agree with everyone else and where where they see it different. The other key attributes is that there's both qualitative and quantitative analysis. So uh, in many ways, you know, thinking about uh, answering questions of the future. It's very qualitative in nature, uh, thinking about the experiences of others and, and that insight of others. Um, but there is some quantitative analysis as well that helps us to, to, to measure that, um, that consensus piece. So some strengths and weaknesses. Um, so one of the biggest strengths is that the anonymity improves the likelihood of individuals being truthful. Um, people don't have to be embarrassed of their opinion or uh, fearful of what others might think of their opinion. Um, even, you know, fear of being argued with. So, so this anonymity is very important um, and, and helpful in getting people to tell you what they really think. It also avoids the halo effect of powerful members of the group. Sometimes you have one, you know, one expert in the room, I know in, in, in healthcare, um, that happens a lot, maybe a physician or, um, you know, someone, a director, a high-powered person will say, well, I think this is going to happen in the future, and it's very hard for others in a room to, to respond to that or to disagree with that because they have this, um, you know, this kind of uh, this halo effect, or they might simply be convinced because that person is the one that's saying it. So uh, in the Delphi methodology, this, this anonymity helps us to avoid that as well. And then several rounds gives participants the, the opportunity to change or revise their opinion. Um, and, and all of that is related to the feedback that they're given as, as part of the process. So it's not about, you know, forcing someone to change opinions. Um, it, it really is about seeking and, and finding new information and being able to integrate that information in your, um, in your judgment, in your wisdom, and then coming on the other side with a new opinion. Some of the weaknesses are that the change of opinions may be because of peer pressure as opposed to true change. So you might have somebody see on the you know, Delphi uh, results that every single other person has uh, you know, agreed with this and they're the only one disagreeing. So they might just flip over to agree because they want to avoid you know, uh, further iterations of the, of the questioning. Um, there's also uncertainty about the meaning of consensus. So what exactly does that mean? Does it mean that more than half of the people feel that it's true? Does it mean that 100% of the people think it's true? Uh, so this can be difficult because there's no set uh, standard for, for this methodology. And the, there's a difference in the qualitative analysis of, of responses across Delphi studies. That's one of the biggest, um, I think, gripes about people when they're reading uh, Delphi papers. Uh, because the, the authors don't necessarily go through and explain the rigor of their qualitative analysis by talking about how they came up with themes. So we're now going to go through the steps of Delphi, and we're just going to kind of skim over some of these uh, quickly because I'm going to go more in depth when I'm talking about the research that we completed. Um, so. The, the first step is to determine if Delphi methodology is, um, is appropriate. So it's important to understand the, the power of the method and what it's best used for, but it's also important to understand its limitations. So thinking about um, the level of evidence that's provided by a Delphi study, um, we are looking at uh, the lowest level of evidence. Even though we're doing um, data analysis, we're doing qualitative and quantitative analysis of this. Um, the fact is, we're asking people their opinions. So even though it's a a uh, you know a group of opinions, even though it's a you know it's been analyzed and and a certain methodology is used, it still is simply an expert opinion. So this type of research can't be used for. Um, or you know, testing and intervention, obviously, or um, or even really um, convincing folks to use a certain type of intervention in healthcare uh, without future research to prove that that intervention would work. So, um, so the the times that it's best to use Delphi methodology 
is when not much is known about the issue, so specific analysis would be difficult. So this is similar to, to a qualitative study. So we've got um, you know, an area just like the Cold War, um, maybe some other thing that is new, like, you know, thinking about COVID-19 that just happened. So in areas where there's not a lot of research or there's not um, you know, things that are already written down and figured out, um, we can't count something, we can't measure something directly. Uh, we can use Delphi to start figuring that out. Another reason to use Delphi is if the issue is complex and many different types of experts are needed to analyze it. So Delphi helps us, we, you know, we don't, again, have to get everybody in the same room. We can use um, some of these, you know, mailings or, or, um, or softwares to collect the information. So if you've got a lot of different folks, maybe even folks that don't speak the same language, folks that are working in very different fields, you need everybody to answer these questions, Delphi can really help with that. Another reason to use it um, is that just many experts in general are needed, or it's just impractical to get everybody in the same room. Sometimes that happens, you know, even in a even in a healthcare setting, you know, you might have people working day shift and night shift and can't get them in the same room in a really small uh, setting, or or might be that people live across the country or or the world, um, and so can't get them in the same room together. So Delphi is helpful there. There. It also is helpful if there's a likelihood of peer pressure or power differentials affecting the expert's answers. Um, so, you know, we talked about that before. If, if someone in the room has a lot of power and they're saying something, it's difficult to disagree with them or, um, or come up with your own answer. And then the last thing is that the issue is future-oriented. Obviously, we can't, you know, uh, empirically measure uh, the future. So we can't count it. We can't, uh, you know, we can't use numbers to, to measure it. So, so Delphi can help us with this informed judgment um, to do this, you know, informed, uh, educated guesses. So if it's a future-oriented issue, Delphi is a great, uh, great methodology to use. So after you've determined if, uh, if the Delphi methodology is the right one for your project, the next step is to choose experts. So um, one of the, you know, one of the great things about Delphi and one of the um, difficult things about Delphi, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, barriers and boundaries, uh, not a lot of specific um, kind of uh, qualifications to make it a Delphi study. I think some of that is because of its newness as a methodology when compared to other types of methodology. Um, and some of it is because of the sort of qualitative nature of it. So there's no specific criteria for selecting the sample size or the members. Uh, so knowing how many people to recruit or which people to recruit are kind of up to the person doing the project. So certainly there are some um, ways that we can pick people, obviously characteristics like educational preparation, a job title or experience, Participation in a specialty group, even something like this group here, um, or another professional practice group, or a certification in something. All of these can indicate that the person is an expert and is able to answer questions that you might have about the area. And the number of participants really should be based on the diversity of your group. So a lot of folks start with 8 to 12 folks, um, but if there are a lot of different perspectives or a lot of different types of experts that are in your group, probably want to have more participants. So the more diverse the voices you want, um, the more participants you want to recruit. So for step three, um, and again, this is an iterative um, process of asking questions. There is no limit to the number of rounds, um, but in general, the round one is the exploration phase. So we start in our exploration phase with open-ended questions. This is that qualitative portion. Um, open-ended questions, and we receive back uh, you know, a series of words that we can go through and analyze. And we'll talk a little bit about the analysis in just a second. But once we have that analysis, we will use those results to construct the second survey. So this is our exploration phase. We are reaching out, we're casting a wide net to pull 
pull back as much of this expertise that's available from our group as possible. So in round two, we're moving to the evaluation phase. So we want to provide controlled feedback and then have participants respond and prioritize the options. So controlled feedback is, you know, is clarification, is, um, you know, this is what others said. Um, this, these are some things to consider. This is some information that might be helpful. So controlled feedback obviously means we're not trying to bias our experts at all, but we're providing them the information and the feedback they need to make the decisions moving forward for future rounds. So then we analyze the data. This is where the quantitative um, analysis comes in. We're going to analyze the data from the second round and then prepare for the third round if we've decided to do a third round. So this is, again, an evaluation phase. Um, so, you know, the the experts once again receive the prioritized list from the second round and and then you ask for comments and consensus so they can they can write why they think that this is true or that why they think it isn't true um, maybe if someone is very opposed to something or very much against something being included um, they can write that information out to be to, you know to be sent to the rest of the group uh, so in these future rounds, and again, you can do as many rounds as you want to or need to gain consensus, but a lot of folks can will remove the items um, when consensus is received in previous rounds. So maybe if you have, if 100% of your folks or 80% of your folks say that this should be included or this is true, you don't necessarily have to keep, uh, keep sending that out. You can send out the ones where agreement hasn't been reached yet. So for the qualitative analysis, um, in your round one, there are different ways to do this analysis. So there's the very simplest way, um, and just simply looking at word count. So you know you can uh, use some of the free software um, where you create a, a word cloud. You can you know use all kinds of different software to to, uh, to figure out which uh, which words are used most. Now obviously this is a this is a method that's not very rigorous. It's, um, it's a pretty weak method because obviously we know that people use different words. Um, if you're using open-ended questions, they're probably responding in sentences or um, you know, even paragraphs. And so simply using a word count is a good way to do a first original sweep of the data, but it's usually not where you want to end up unless it's something very, very simple that you can truly, you know, if you truly have one or two word answers. So the next step up is, is doing kind of a content analysis. So going through the, the data, the, the qualitative data, and seeing what you have in there. Um, so this is taking a look at some broader, you know, this is looking at your phrases and paragraphs and seeing what's in there. And then you've got the thematic analysis, which is a true kind of qualitative research methodology that you can use. You can, um, you know, print out your transcripts of of your responses and truly do line by line coding, uh, pulling out some of the some of the um, the themes um, and really looking through and making sure that you have uh, you have pulled out all of the um, all of the the contents of that data of that rich data um, to analyze for future rounds. So for quantitative analysis in your subsequent rounds. Um, when I said it was simple data analysis, I meant it. So we're just talking about descriptive statistics, um, mean, median, uh, maybe standard deviation, if you want to look at the folks' um, uh, agreement or disagreement. Some people will use Cronbox Alpha just to see, if, especially if they're using it for some kind of a, a competency tool or um, something related to, you know, Talking about a role or or something like that, where you would want to see that the that the different um, the different characteristics or the different themes were related to each other as well. But uh, but simple descriptive statistics, looking at um, how many people agreed uh, and and how highly they rated these different things. So it's important to review the data for a couple of things. So you want to see um, where there are areas of agreement, and again. You know, sometimes you'll have really simple things where most people say, yep, that's, I agree with that and, and, you know, kind of move on from there. You want to look too for areas of disagreement. Um, 
you also want to look for areas needing clarification. So sometimes when you have disagreement, it's not true disagreement. It's because either the question is confusing or maybe folks aren't sure exactly what you're talking about. So if you have an area where there's a big, you know, big difference of opinion, you might uh, you might take a look at clarifying, or it might be that people don't don't understand exactly what you're trying to say, and so um, so providing that feedback and providing that extra information in future iterations of the questions can be helpful. So I have some examples of Delphi in action, some papers that I just pulled, um, um, just quickly going through and looking um, in Google Scholar. So one of them, this, this one on the left, uh, the multinational Delphi consensus to end the COVID-19 public health threat. Um, so this was a great example of a of a big picture, um, you know, study. They used 386 um, folks from across the world, um, you know, 120, 112 countries, and they came up with um, with consensus statements and recommendations for ending um, the COVID-19 health threat. This is a great example of, of a good use of Delphi methodology. Obviously, you know, there we don't have evidence-based ways of, of ending the, the COVID-19 public health threat, at least at that time. Um, and so this is a future-oriented thing that the informed judgment of the experts can really help guide uh, future interventions that we can then test uh, to make sure that we are doing evidence-based things to respond. But this is a great foundational study using Delphi methodology to get some information that we really needed. So some other smaller scale ones are, uh, you know, this one on the right top, leadership competencies for physical therapists, a Delphi determination. So this is pretty, uh, pretty common. Um, different competencies for maybe a new role or maybe a different role than, than the, the folks usually participate in. So, you know, most physical therapists don't necessarily have, uh, have leadership competencies right when they come out of school. That's something that they de develop over time. And so having experts come together and determine um, what those leadership competencies are is important. And then another one, um, so the de development of key performance indicators to capture in measuring the impact of pharmacists in caring for patients with epilepsy in primary health. So this one maybe is an area that there, you know, you could measure this um, in different ways, but this was a, a way of quickly coming to understand uh, something that's going on at, to, to, pro to provide a foundation for future research. So these are all great ways of using um, using Delphi methodology. So for the study that that we did um, in my organization, we actually uh, used Delphi to create a socioecological model. And I'm going to go through a little bit of the theoretical background of our of our study, just so you kind of understand why we did it and and the questions we were asking of our experts and and why we chose the experts we chose. So. Uh, we were looking at uh, transition to practice for registered nurses. So we know based on research from the 1960s that the transition to practice for nurses and really most healthcare professionals can be very difficult. Um, so they moved through this, uh, this transition to practice model uh, that has been proven over and over and over again to be a, a common uh, experience for a lot of nurses transitioning to practice. So they go through these changes in responsibilities, this kind of packing on and almost getting buried in new knowledge, um, this change in roles from a student or even kind of a teenager adolescent to an adult with a, with a role of caring for other people, and then relationships, both relationships inside and outside of the hospital setting. And while they're experiencing all of these changes and all this transition to practice, they go through this spectrum of experience. They go through loss, doubt, confusion, disorientation, and transition shock. So essentially, um, we have a lot of new graduate nurses who kind of go, hey, I didn't sign up for this. Um, you know, I, I thought this was going to be, uh, you know, taking care of babies and all this stuff, and I'm, I'm having... I'm having people die, or I'm, 
I'm uh, having people yell at me. Some of some of these expectations that are um, that are not fulfilled, and maybe things that they didn't expect actually happening to them. So this can be a very difficult time, and it, it is a big problem for transition to practice programs because it's very expensive to train a new graduate nurse, and certainly we need them. Uh, we need them in order to, you know, continue to be able to take care of patients in the hospital. So being able to figure out what we can do to help in this process um, is really important. So we wanted to specifically tackle uh, one of the aspects of the model, and those were the relationships. And so we know um, also based on theory, the specifically Bronfen Brenner's Ecology of Human Development, that uh, interactions and relationships, uh, not just immediate relationships, but over, you know, in, in the community, um, in society as a whole, um, affect the way that people develop. So a person that's learning, a person that's developing as a registered nurse um, is having a lot of these interactions, um, once again, both inside and outside of the hospital. Uh, so our trouble here with these theories, and we kind of put these theories together and we say, well, we know from the transition to practice model that relationships are important and that we're going through this, you know, this spectrum of difficulty that really puts, uh, puts new registered nurses at risk for not being able to complete their, um, their transition to practice and serve as, as functioning registered nurses. Um, so, and put that together with, uh, what we know about the socio-ecological model and that these, these interactions are, um, are important for development. So in essence, we know that these relationships and these interactions can get the new graduate nurses from a place of transition shock to a functioning registered nurse that's contributing to the healthcare system as a whole and, and, and caring for patients. But we, what we don't know is what are those relationships? What are those interactions? What are those characteristics of the person? And, and how important are they in, in the transition to practice for, for a new registered nurse? So that, that's what we wanted to know. Uh, so the first step, um, again, of this, doing this Delphi in action is to ask ourselves, is this the right methodology? So thinking about this problem, we have, you know, we have two theories that give us a lot of answers to our questions, but the the big missing piece is, is you know, what, what are these relationships? What specifically are the relationships that, that is affecting um, the, the people? So, you know, for me, the, the best way of figuring that out is asking the people, the people that are experiencing it. So this is a great example of a, of a place where Adelphi methodology can work really well. Um, you know, you, you want to ask questions of a group of people. Um, and and figure out what they have to say and what they think. And so um, so that's what we did. We chose Delphi methodology and uh, and we asked. So step two was to figure out what experts do we need. So the, the obvious uh, obvious first choice is of course the folks that are going through the process. So those folks um, that are that are experiencing, the transition to practice and some of that transition shock were the new graduate registered nurses. So folks in our um, first year nurse residency program, they know about uh, transition shock because they're experiencing it. And they know about the relationships and interactions um, that are important because they're experiencing it. We also wanted to include though some folks that could look at this from the outside. Uh, so when, when you're in a situation, sometimes it's difficult to look at the full picture. So we also ask uh, experts in nursing professional development who work with new graduate nurses all the time to also participate and tell us uh, what relationships they saw as being important. So step three um, was to go through and, uh, and do the data collection and analysis. So for our, our round one, um, data collection, we actually did thematic analysis. So we wrote some pretty um, generic questions. Uh, so what, what individual factors are important for your transition to practice? What relationship factors are important for your transition to practice? What community factors, what society factors? 
we also asked some other generic questions, kind of like, um, what else do you think about transition to practice to pull some of that information in? And, uh, and um, you know, what, what has been your experience? They had the opportunity. What else do you think is important for us to know? They had the opportunity to put that in there too. So we did a thematic analysis. Um, so we, we actually, um, this is kind of a brainstorming session where we were pulling out some things in our initial analysis, but we actually um, did line by line coding and we created categories of, um, of the responses. We had some very, very, very long responses and we had some very, very short responses. So just a rich amount of data um, to take a look at and go through and comb through and, and, and sort out into these categories. So once we had categories, we, we placed the categories into themes, um, you know, thinking about uh, like uh, safe housing, you know, kind of was a factor um, that was related to, you know, being feeling good about going home at night, that you weren't going to become injured, you know, knowing that you could pay your mortgage, you know, all kinds of things. So we, we looked at those things that were related and kind of put them together. And then we determined the number of times each theme was mentioned. So we were already starting to look at what the what these nurse residents, what these first year nurses were writing and how many people were writing the same kind of thing. So we could we were starting even with this first round to understand what areas of consensus there might be. So the second uh, round of data collection was our um, our rating of the importance of the relationships. So we actually had decided before we even started that we were only going to do two rounds, and we decided that if the um, if there was 80% consensus, if 80% of the residents rated the relationship or the interaction as somewhat important or very important, then we would retain that in the in the model. And so we had we had determined that cutoff of 80% as our definition of consensus. So we had we placed the um, the themes um, in a in another electronic survey. And we were able to send that out again. And so each of the themes, we said, how important is blank to you? Um, how important is this interaction to you? And so the, the, the nurse residents would rate these. Um, and then we got all the data back. And we, we did um, two different analyses. We, we pulled out um, the, um, the, the percent agreement as well as the mean score. So in addition to looking at the consensus of how many people agreed, we also took a look at how highly they rated each of these things. So I'm gonna go through and show you some of the results. Uh, so these are, these are the retained factors. Uh, so these are individual factors. These were the things that the nurse residents thought about themselves that helped them or made it more difficult for them um, to go through the, um, the process of transition to practice. So some of these are pretty, um, you know, pretty expected. You know, we, we, we are pretty sure that confidence is always going to be a big factor in these folks. Uh, communication skills was something for them. This group um, did not really do clinicals in the hospital, so they did a lot of simulation and did not learn how to talk to patients um, as much as uh, previous groups. So. They rated communication skills really high. And then attitude. They felt like attitude was a big part of their, their process. Um, so community, let's see, relationship factors. Um, not surprisingly, they, they rated the, uh, the, the interactions, the relationships inside of the hospital higher than, um, than some relationships outside of the hospital. I really think that this might have to do also with the fact that they have different um, different relationships outside of the hospital. So we were looking for consensus for the things that affect everyone involved in, um, in a transition to practice. So like, for example, not everyone has a spouse or not everyone has uh, children. So those things did not um, score as high as uh, friends who are nurses or workplace friends. Um, or some of the peers and coworkers, clinical coaches, stuff like that. So, so that was a that was an area of consensus that 
that, that got a much, uh, much higher rating. The community factors involved housing, um, the, the affordability, the location of the housing in relation to their to where they worked and their safety, um, things like the educational offerings both inside and outside of the hospital. And some folks were going back to get their master's program. Um, the big ones were once again, um, you know, inside of the hospital or things that were related to the hospital, like hospital culture, um, hospital factors like the staffing, the patient types, and then access to personal resources. You know, these folks are making a decent living as, as new graduate registered nurses, but they are transitioning from perhaps living with their parents to, you know, kind of putting a, a home together. So they, they don't necessarily have um, any savings, they're trying to get an apartment, they're trying to get down payments and things like that. So that's a big stressor for them and that really affects their transition to practice. One of the outside factors was the demographics in the community, so the patients that they were interacting with. Um, that was a lower consensus but, but rated very highly by those that felt that way. And then societal factors, and these aren't surprising. So the nursing shortage obviously was the biggest one that affected their, their transition to practice. A lot of times because uh, newer nurses were, were orienting them um, and, and helping them go through the process because we had lost some, uh, some of the more experienced nurses. And then, you know, laws and policies that, that guide practice, even appreciation for nurses. So I like this one, um, you know, that they felt the love from uh, from society as a whole for their profession, and that was an important part of their transition to practice. So what we learned from this, you know, certainly there are limitations. It's a very generic um, look at what uh, what these folks are going through and and how they're going through their transition to practice. But we did get a, a you know overarching view of um, you know the importance of relationships in transitioning nurses and which relationships were the most important. So you know, certain ones, um, you know, we can work on on making sure they do have people that they can talk to that are also nurses, uh, you know, helping them to, uh, to to have healthy relationships at home. Who, What can they talk about with their family members that happens at work and what are they not allowed to? Some nurses struggle with that, with figuring that out when they're new. And then areas like unit socialization, so getting to know everybody in the unit, um, financial literacy classes and communication trainings are really important. So we were able to get this foundational knowledge about the about the interactions that affect the development of a, of a first year um, registered nurse, and this really helped us give us some ideas of some things that we can do right away, um, and then study uh, to to kind of uh, do research where we can recommend uh, evidence based interventions. But we, we got this foundation based on the Delphi methodology and based on consensus of these folks that participated. And so in summary, I, I love this, I love this methodology. I hope that you um, were able to, to get some ideas uh, from Delphi. I just think it's a great, a great way of, of getting more information from people. Um, you know, people love to share their opinions. Uh, and and so this is a this is really a, a cool way of, of collecting those opinions from people that know a lot and really coming up with some good conclusions and good solutions uh, for some of the problems in healthcare right now. And so that is the end of my presentation and I would love to uh, I would love to hear your questions. Thanks Heidi, that was really interesting and we do have some questions. Um, how are the means calculated? So the means are calculated, uh, I used an Excel form. So we are simply using, using an average of the, of the ratings. So for example, um, if you have, you know, if the Likert scale is scored one to five, we're simply looking at the average of those, of those scores among all the participants. And about how long did your study take? It took us about, uh, four months. So the reason it took a little bit longer was because the the different groups of the new grads would meet together at different times. We did this over our whole system. We had over 200 participants in this particular study. So because they met at different times and we wanted them to have the opportunity in the class to uh, to fill out the, the surveys, um, it, it took us a little longer than normal. 
And, and was everybody in one, was this one location that did the study? This was over, this was in our entire system. Um, so 17 hospitals uh, were represented and this, you know, was a large academic medical center, a rehabilitation hospital, lots of community hospitals. So a big, uh, big spectrum of, of uh, neighborhoods and, and folks that were working there. Awesome. Does anybody have other questions? Um, did the participants get to see the final results? Yes. So we have been, so I actually, right before this, I, I was almost going to be late for, uh, for the webinar because I was presenting to the, uh, uh, at our facility today. Um, what did they think about the results that the study got? So it is, I, I think that the, you know, it, it is a, uh, a relief for many of them to understand the transition to practice. I think it's easy for, um, for a lot of new grads to kind of think that they're, that they're crazy or that they're, they're not good enough to, to go through the process. And so having this kind of put out in front of them that this transition to practice involves so many different relationships and interactions and that they are, you know, they have power to change that, but also, you know, they need to rely upon the power of others in their lives. I think it makes sense to them. It's kind of intuitive for them. And it also uh, gives them some relief. And, and for the really new folks, it is a way of, you know, guiding them towards people that can help them. So they, knowing that having a coworker that has gone through what they've that what they're going through can help them with their transition to practice, I think is great information for them. And, and maybe thinking about um, making wise financial decisions and that will not only help their lives, but their actual career and transition to practice. I think those are some helpful things as well. And um, what actions are being taken based on the study? Have you determined what might be implemented based on the study? Yeah, so we are, we have a, an accredited program. Um, our, our nurse residency program is, is uh, kind of the, the same throughout the system. So we have integrated some uh, trauma informed approach to deal with some of the um, difficult issues. And the trauma informed approach is, is uh, includes peer support. So we have uh, professional development practitioners meeting with the, uh, with the individuals on a regular basis. Um, and also in addition to that, facilitating their integration into the unit. So that is, um, as an example, we had a, one of the new grads come and present today right after I did. And um, uh, she had five nurses from the unit come and watch her talk. And I said, well, this is kind of, you know, the, my presentation in, uh, you know, in action. They, they came here uh, because they support her and want, want her to succeed. Um, and so that is something we're really focusing on, that peer support. I think in the future, we will take a look at some of the other um, more uh, practical things, helping them, you know, these guys are, are young adults and they're maybe having their first relationship, maybe having their, uh, their first uh, time living outside of, of their parents' house. So. Obviously, those are delicate situations, and so we want to make sure that we build those programs in a way that makes the most sense for, for them and makes them feel the most comfortable. But we have lots of resources um, in the hospital already to deal with kind of mental health stuff, but also bringing in those things that will help with the, the physical um, needs and, and some of those transition needs that the, the new grads have as well. Great. Sounds like this was uh, really effective. Um, really interesting. Thanks so much, Heidi. Thank um, you. I want to thank everybody for coming to our webinar. It was brought to you by the healthcare division and the statistics division. And um, you will be getting an email with me from me with um, with slides and the YouTube and your credits for watching the webinar.
and we have more webinars coming so keep a keep an eye out and um, appreciate everyone attending the webinar today thanks so much i think we'll end here for today thank you